We're on Route 24, a major east-west thoroughfare in northern New Jersey. Think trees and brick buildings, and in a beautiful stand of trees, the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. We're here on the campus of Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, and behind me is a beautiful brick building, the Bone Gymnasium, that was constructed in 1909. How do I know that? Check this out. Come on back, check out the original 1909 cornerstone. But then in 1998, artistic director Bonnie Monte, a far-sighted board of directors, and the F.M. Kirby family raised $7 million for this truly state-of-the-art theater. And so the state-of-the-art gymnasium from 1909 became a state-of-the-art theater in 1998. Every time you come to the Shakespeare Theater in New Jersey, you find a new magical environment, completely unimaginable from the last time you were here. Did you ever wonder, where does all this stuff come from? They do plays back to back, so they can't construct anything in the theater. To find out, we're gonna start our journey actually behind the theater. We're here at the back of the theater, and in theater vocabulary, this is called the load-in. They're moving all the sets for the next show into the theater, through those stairs and that door. The Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey is very fortunate to have one large facility where they make all their sets, make their costumes, and rehearse their shows. They can actually rehearse the shows on the actual set. Bonnie Monty, the artistic director of the theater, calls it the Theater Factory. Let's go check it out. This quote from Henry VIII is one of the many around the walls of the theater factory. These are the youths that thunder at a playhouse. <laughs> Let's meet some of these thundering workers. Steve Beckel, director of production of the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. Yes. That's terrific. And you oversee this entire shop. Yes, I guess I do. <laughs> I guess you do. <laughs> now behind you I see a lot of people working on lumber yep. and cutting stuff up. Mm -hmm. And over on the far side of the shop, they're painting. Correct. And we're in such a big room, it's hard to translate this to people watching at home. Mm -hmm. How large is this room? This room uh, itself, just the shops, is 20,000 square feet. Wow. 20,000 square feet. Let's walk through it a little sure. bit. So I'm imagining this would be several tennis courts, easily a basketball court. Yes, most definitely. Um, and it feels like a football field. <laughs> it does. But that's great for you guys because you can just about put together the full set here, right? Yes, we can. And we can build it, assemble it in the center section here, and paint it over on the other side. So. And the, that, those, uh, those are cliffs behind us, right? Yes, yeah, they're from our previous production of uh, Man of La Mancha. Uh, and we, we like to keep stuff around just in case we might use it again at some point. Sure, sure, mm -hmm. sure. Save a little money. Yes. And overseeing this whole thing like you do, mm -hmm. it'd be great, Steve, if you had some place to overlook it, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would be. It would be really great. Uh, we have our crow's nest right above us uh, here where we, uh, we watch all this go together. We have our meetings and make sure that everything's going together the way we want to. So just this way. Let's go. Thank you. So here we are in the crow's nest, which, Steve, looks like a perfect place to talk about how one piece of the set might go together with another. Uh, it is. Uh, when we designed the, this space uh, for the shop, uh, we had in mind that we would have our production meetings here and as directors and designers can all gather uh, in this space and look out and we can uh, find problems before they become problems uh, right. to see what the progress is as we go. It sounds just perfect. As a matter of fact, the whole idea of having set construction, costume construction, mm -hmm. uh, all the aspects of what you have to put together in one large building mm -hmm. It's just terrific, isn't it? It is. We uh, came from a variety of places together. Our costume shop was in one building. Our scene shop was in another building. They were miles apart from each other. Uh, so this is kind of the culmination of many years uh, of, of work and dreams that we uh, put together uh, to do this uh, space to allow us to have uh, everything together. So now if you've got a question, mm -hmm. you just have to walk down the hall yes. to ask the director or the artistic director about mm -hmm. something. You're that close. Yeah, it makes it much easier to manage. Uh, I can, I can, when I have a question in my costume shop, I don't have to call them on the phone uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and interrupt them. I can just go down to the shop and while they're working, I can talk to them and, and get things wow. going. Wow, wow, it sounds perfect. So if there are other people in college right now, perhaps mm -hmm. electrical engineers mm -hmm. or whatever they're majoring in, but not theater, mm -hmm. it's good for them to know that 
This is a route to just get, you got into theater in the summer, is that what I'm getting? Uh, actually, uh, throughout the year. Uh, it was oh, okay. uh, throughout the year, uh, a variety of performances. Uh, I got there because uh, I went to do uh, lighting and sound uh, through them, and, and that was how it connected to my electrical engineering uh, degree uh, from there. But at the same um, time, you got yeah. the electrical engineering I did. degree yep. while you worked in theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was a way to, to be able to, uh, to pay for college as I went through, <laughs> I was pushing boxes off of trucks and, uh, and setting up big, large yeah. uh, shows to. Uh, uh, for the people to come see. That's great to know. It's great to know that that route exists. Almost definitely. Yeah, there's a lot of people, but I'd say about half of the people in theater, uh, in technical theater, have gotten here through other ways. My wife works for the Metropolitan Opera and is an archaeology major. Uh, archaeology <laughs> so major. Totally different from uh, where she was in school. Uh, but uh, but she you know she went through the school, found the things that she liked, and now she makes costumes. Uh, right. Living, so. Right. That's yeah. wonderful. Mm -hmm. So. I'm trying to imagine you guys, you're sitting here having mm -hmm. a production meeting, talking with the director about how things are coming together, yep. and while you're having that conversation, you can actually look out the window and refer to this set piece or that set piece? Correct, yeah, the shops will all still continue to work while we're up here meeting. Uh, we can talk about uh, things an awful, uh, a, lot, a lot in detail. Jonathan Wentz, former scenic painter, now scenic designer. Correct. And uh, what's the show you're designing right now? The Alchemist by Ben Johnson. Okay, The Alchemist by Ben Johnson, contemporary of Shakespeare? Uh, yeah, about the same period. Uh -huh. Yeah, a little different style, but... Well, a lot of stuff going on behind us. People doing what you were doing, scenic painting, yeah. before you started designing. Um, any way you can summarize what they're doing back there? Um, well, basically, as the shop gets things built that, I, that I've designed and drawings with, I work with the TD, then the TD does construction drawings on the other half of the shop, they build the units, and then as things get built, they come over to our side to the paint deck, and then uh, my staff uh, paints them uh, as, much as, um, as much as we can do ahead of time as possible before it's loaded into the theater. Okay, and we have a lot of people wondering, what is a TD? TD is a technical director. He's in charge of the construction. Actually, he's in charge of the whole shop, um, but he's primarily in charge of the construction team and getting the drawings uh, converted to something that they can understand for building. And something they can understand. You can then paint. Correct. Well, show me some of this stuff. This masonite with the fake flagstones on it is going on a platform because it has no strength itself, yes? Correct. Okay, let me just meet these folks. Hi, I'm Chase. Hi, are... I'm Emily. Hi, Emily. Hi, I'm Michael. Hi, hi, Michael, Emily, Michael, and... I'm Cassie. Hi, hi, Kathy. Okay, so you got three people working on... So they're putting coat one on this. Right, which is basically um, trying to capture sort of the heart of the wood, mm. the, the sort of glow that's underneath. And so we use like a, a yellow, an ochre, and a sienna, and we mix them together with a wet blend, and then that creates the base color. Wow. wow. And, uh, and these folks represent um, the roughly 75 to 100 uh, educational interns that come here each summer and there's they're dispersed in all the different shops so they're college students um, at various uh, degrees of experience and they come here both to learn and to be part of the crew for the summer a, hu a hundred interns yeah roughly uh, 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 yeah between um, the the production and then uh, there's also folks in the administrative section mm -hmm. you know marketing publicity right. uh, production right. Uh, education. Well, that's terrific that you give so many young people. I'm calling you guys young people. Is that okay? <laughs> you give so many people a chance to break into theater. To get yeah, into it's theater. actually sort of one of the hallmarks of the company is that we see ourselves as a learning, teaching theater company. And from Taming of the Shrew, oh, this learning, what a thing it is. We've been talking about learning. Let's meet another student of the theater who's gone on to be in charge of all the props. Helen Tewksbury, the prop mistress of the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. What a fun name you have, Tewksbury. Thank you. <laughs> Did you pick it out or it just... No, it's my dad's. Ah, well tell him it was a good choice. Okay. So you're working on, what are you working on here? Uh, I am working on a tapestry curtain for Wittenberg. Okay, and a tapestry curtain, so it's a hunk of fabric that's going to hang on the set. Yep. And what are you doing with it right now? Uh, I'm piecing the separate kinds of fabric together so that it looks like a finely woven piece of art. Right. And you chose this blue to go against the red, and you created this whole thing. Yep. It's uh, designed to go with this cross right here. Mm -hmm. It was a, a 
piece I purchased. This cross right here, yeah, mm -hmm. I see, and it's a beautiful cross, and it's a beautiful tapestry. So a prop mistress creates stuff, and you what, you read the play and see what's needed, and? Yep, I uh, read the play and find out what's in the script, and then the scenic designer or the director uh, adds things that they think they want. Right. And um, then it's my job to go out and find them or build them or rent them and uh, put them on stage for everybody. And what do we call this terrific room you get to work in? This is the uh, home of props or what? <laughs> uh, this is just my prop shop. Prop shop. I like that name too. It's Helen Tewksbury in her own prop shop. So we have a lot of things, props around here. Who is this guy? That's William Shakespeare. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> I knew that. And I noticed that you have two water bottles here, one of them with no label. <laughs> Why is that, Helen? Uh, because I'm a nervous fidgeter and I rip labels off things. <laughs> and it wouldn't have to, anything to do with the fact that you're a prop mistress who often has to put something on stage where it does not have a label. I do that often, too, yeah, especially right. with uh, wine bottles. I, of course. So I think you'd be a big label ripper offer. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you get into this line of work? Uh, well, originally, uh, it was because of my grandfather. He was Peter Tewksbury. He created and directed My Three Sons and Father Knows Best. Wow. And when I was a kid, he used to tell me stories about being on set and working in film and theater. And I thought it sounded like fun, so I just started doing it in high school and then loved it so much I went to college for it. So how did you get into the line of props? So you started working in the theater. Yep. Um, I started in high school just acting and building sets and helping prop the shows uh, for my drama club. And then when I went to college, uh, I decided I wanted to uh, uh, work in carpentry more. So I went actually uh, got my degree in master carpentry. And then part of way through my uh, degree, I got a little bored just doing carpentry. So I started working in the prop shop. Uh, where I got to work with so many different materials and work on so many different projects that I was like, this is for me. Yeah, and you certainly won't be bored here. No. Nope. What a great environment to work in. How did you end up here at the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey? Uh, I went to USITT, uh, which is a th technical theater conference. And held. For annually. those of us who don't know, which includes me, what is USITT? TC stands for? <laughs> USITT stands for United States Institute of Theater Technology. Theater Technology. Yes. I'm just impressed right there. Just the fact that we have an Institute of Theater Technology, it sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's just a technical conference that's held annually. And I walked around all the different booths and I met uh, Steve Beckel, our director of production there. And he interviewed me for the summer professional training program that we have here every summer. So you started off as an intern right here. Yep. And uh, then when, as soon as my internship was over, uh, the higher ups here liked my work so much that they asked me to stay on. And I became the assistant props master. Assistant props master. And how long were you in that position? I did that for two years uh, until my uh, former boss decided that she wanted to move on to other things. And then they offered me the props master position here. Wow, terrific. And how long have you been the prop's mistress here? Uh, just a little over a year. You having fun? Yes. It looks like a great facility to work at. It's amazing. And props are such a great effect on how we see everything and the details of a production. You're, you must be a wonderful addition to everybody you work with on every show you do. Oh, I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got a lot of sewing to do, I guess, so yep. we'll let you get back to sewing. But thanks very much for talking with us. Thank you. And from measure for measure, I do desire to learn, sir. Let's follow up on Helen's sewing activity and meet the people who do the wardrobe sewing, the costume construction crew. We're here in the costume shop where costumes are actually under construction. What's your name? I'm Sam Reckford. Hi, Sam Reckford. And what's your name? Madeira. Hi, Madeira. And can you guys roughly tell me what you're doing here? Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> okay. I'm doing a mock-up for one of the costumes for the alchemist. Okay, a mock-up for a costume, meaning to see how it would fit on an actor or actress? Okay. And I think I know what you're doing, you're sewing. Well, I'm serging. Okay. And that's in preparation for washing and dyeing it. So the serger uses three threads to create this casing around the edge of the fabric, and that way it doesn't fray and come apart completely when we get it wet. Right, so when stuff I own starts coming apart on the edge, it's because nobody surged it, right? <laughs> Potentially. 
<laughs> okay. Or you wore right through it. Great. And uh, down here, I think I have a rough idea of what you're doing. What's your name? Hi, I'm Sue. Hi, Sue. <laughs> you're draping something? No, no, no. I'm oh, just okay. <laughs> I'm rolling it up. I'm getting it ready for our uh, first hand over there to start cutting it out. Okay. All right. So you're getting this ready to go that direction. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I'll go that direction. What's your name? Hi, I'm Caroline. Hi, Caroline. Caroline. And so am I right that the fabric is going to come from Tiffany to actually, you? Actually, no, it works in the other direction. Oh, okay. I actually I work on all the patterns uh, from the fittings to make sure anything that needs to change changes on paper. Okay. So that after we have cut everything out of the muslin, as we have right here, uh, it can whatever needs to change can change on the paper so it can go into whatever our final fabric is going to be uh, without any mistakes and without too much fudging around once we actually get the costume on the actor. Okay, but one costume moves through all you people yes. somehow. Yes, to be constructed. we all have a hand on it. You all have a hand on and it. And usually when we start getting closer to the costumes being on stage, we all do a little bit of everything based on what needs to get done and how much time we have. Wow, so now we all know what costume construction means. And from Hamlet, oh, there has been much throwing about of brains. And now let's meet the brain behind it all, Bonnie Monte. Bonnie Monte, the artistic director of the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. It's a terrific operation you have going here. And I know from meeting various people on your staff, you've got a very well-educated staff. I often heard as I talked to designers and such that they majored in something else, nothing to do with theater, and then got into theater in the summer. And you guys are very involved in education as well. The main mission of the institution was to produce Shakespeare and other classics. And obviously we have retained that mission in a very um, strong way over the years. But uh, from the very beginning, I added uh, education. And, and I mean the education of a variety of sorts of people um, as a complete second and equal focus of the, of the institution's mission. So uh, we have, I guess the easiest way to talk about it is that we have four um, groups that we focus on in terms of um, learning opportunities. Uh, the first are students, um, and uh, we've tried to make a strong impact on the public education landscape in New Jersey and in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, we focus on uh, the training of young professional artists, and we uh, provide programs for educators and programs for adults who are interested in enriching programs and learning more about classic theater. Mm -hmm. So there's four big groups that we focus on, and we have, uh, I believe at this point, 15 different education programs. Some of them are quite big. Um, we've, uh, we reach thousands and thousands of people every year with these programs. So it's not a, a minor part of what we do, it's a major part of what we do. And unfortunately, I don't think a lot of people know about it. And yeah. do you find the teachers you're working with are initially daunted by Shakespeare, or I mean, is that an educational I mean, process think, also? Yeah, absolutely. I think we run into, um, you know, unfortunately, a significant amount of teachers who are afraid of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have good teachers themselves, so their um, perception of him and his work is somewhat skewed, and I think that they're very gun-shy to some extent. So we actually look for opportunities to train teachers and to work with them. We have um, uh, we had a program for a while that, that was very specifically toward teacher training, and it's been put on a hiatus while we reconsider aspects of it, in part because the state support of those kinds of programs, professional development programs for teachers, has, has certainly, uh, unfortunately, waned in the last few years. So we're looking at other ways of being able to serve educators where it's not um, prohibitive for them. Well, the arts in general, it's harder and harder it's, to finance, isn't it's it? It's a really big problem that I think most theater companies in the world have, which is that while what we do on stage is beautiful and um, appears to be quite extraordinary, um, we are always forced as theater artists to work in pretty uh, sub-level kind <laughs> of conditions. Um, we were finding that, you know, as our work became more and more recognized for um, certainly it's world-class status uh, in terms of quality. We were finding it harder and harder to sustain that level of excellence 
given the work conditions that we were um, suffering under. Mm -hmm. So with a very supportive board uh, behind us, uh, we worked with the board and the staff over the past really 10 years now to uh, identify a, a location that might serve as a centralized support facility for the massive amount of work and education programs that we do. So about, I mean, to make a very long story short, it was a 10 year process. Mm -hmm. And about two years ago, we moved into this building, which um, it, uh, in its former life was an old valve factory, mm -hmm. uh, the Strayman Valve Factory. And um, we did a fairly modest renovation. Uh, in part, it was modest because the building it was almost as though we, it knew we were gonna be the second owners and it was laid out in a, in a perfect way for the kind of work that we do. So we um, worked on a, a, a bit of a renovation for about three or four months, and uh, as a kind of phase one part of this building, and then <clears throat> all of the artists and technicians involved with us on a daily basis that are part of the staff have been working with me um, on what we call phase two of the renovation, which is to basically take the building and turn it into a work of art itself. So that we have the idea that there are artists working inside the work of art that surrounds us. And you've done a terrific job looking Thanks. around this building at all the artwork that you've created or added yeah. to it. It's far from a valve factory. No, it's not a valve factory <laughs> anymore. And all of the art that's being created is, emanates from the world of theater. So a lot of it is, is you, know, you know, installation pieces that are actually created from old sets. Mm -hmm. um, even the way the costumes are stored is kind of a work of art in itself. And everything is looked to with, a, with an artistic eye and a certain aesthetic, yeah. It, it's a terrific space to work in. Is it unusual, Bonnie, nationally to have the theater have everything under one roof that produces theater? I don't think that most theaters um, have a single support space and uh, you know, and, and most operate the way we used to. We, had, we were, at some points, we were in 10, 15 spaces at once, hmm. and everything had to be shuttled back and forth, and it was, uh, in every possible way, the least ideal kind of way to work. And yeah. it must help a lot that a designer can just walk down the hall to talk to a director or an artistic director. Absolutely. You know, if we're in rehearsal and we need a prop, uh, we just go through the door and we're in the prop storage uh, area and mm -hmm. we can pull what we need. And I mean, it's just saving time and money and it's much more collaborative, which is really the essence of our art form. Um, we're able to uh, expand our education programs in this building. All, it, it's solving problems of all kinds for us. It's terrific. Yeah. Well, speaking of Bonnie Monte herself, I know that before this, a couple decades ago, you were an associate of Nikos. Papa, I always get his name wrong. Sakharopoulos. Yeah, Sakharopoulos. Uh, he's now passed. Yeah. But did that have an effect on how you saw being an artistic director? Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, he really was my mentor. I was with him. I started as his assistant and worked my way up through the ranks over almost a 10-year period at, at mm -hmm. the Williamstown Theater Festival. And, uh, and he created the Williamstown Theater Festival. Uh, he wasn't the actual founder, but he was very much... Um, there at the beginning, and I think became artistic director after the first two years. So mm -hmm. he was essentially so he one put, of the founders. He put it yep. on the map. He put it on the map. Much in the same way you put the Shakespeare oh, Theater of New Jersey thank on the you. map. There's no question that a lot of my uh, theatrical orientation emanates from what I absorbed working you know, for him and with him. Yeah. Was that also part of your upbringing? I mean, did you focus in theater as a younger person? Did you major in theater? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I was always involved in the arts. I was, you know, as a kid, I was not, you know, on sports teams. I was taking ballet lessons and mm -hmm. going to writing workshops and doing that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, I majored in um, I majored in theater in as an undergrad. Uh, had a minor in French and English. Uh, then I went to, instead of a graduate program, I went to a conservatory program where I could focus much more on directing mm -hmm. um, and get really up on my feet, hands-on experience. So I did a two-year conservatory program after undergrad, uh, and then I moved to New York. And while you've been the artistic director here, you've directed how many productions? Do you know offhand? More than 50. More than 50. <laughs> um, probably less than 100. but. Okay. Uh, yeah, over a 20 year period, somewhere between, I'd say, it's probably between 60 and 75, either here or at other institutions, yeah. And I think most people have an idea of what a director does, whether they actually have an idea or not, not is sure debatable. I <laughs> think <laughs> like some people do, yeah. But they might be completely confused about the concept or the definition of an artistic director. 
it's it's a difficult role to define because it is so different as it moves from person to person. Um, from my point of view, it is um, I provide the leadership for the institution in um, in all ways, with obviously a strong focus on being the artistic, uh, providing the artistic vision for the company, the, the future vision for the company. I'm um, responsible for making sure that the quality of the work is, as I said, world class, um, and being the person who, in essence, um, creates the magnet for all of the artists of all kinds that end up working here to create the seven or eight productions that we do a year, plus all of the education programming. And I have an incredible senior staff that works with me and are in charge of, of various different departments. I have a director of education, I have a, a casting director, I have a director of development and marketing and production, all of those things. And it's a very collaborative atmosphere here. Um, but with our managing director, uh, we essentially provide the leadership for every single aspect of what we do. And you select the plays every season? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I always find your choices are so eclectic. I mean, it's almost like you're educating us in the audience. I mean, there's stuff, I've stuff I've never heard of, mm -hmm. and I love that. Yeah, I, I actually am thrilled that our audience has come to be very appreciative of the fact that they can see things here that they can't see anywhere else. And that, from our point of view as the artist, that is a great gift that we give to our audience members because I mean, you, anybody, you can see Romeo and Juliet anywhere. And of course, we'll do Romeo and Juliet. We're a Shakespeare theater. Um, but we do have a, a, a special eye for work that um, is unique um, or has uh, been long buried for some reason. And we bring those things to life. As I said, a very unique special gift for our audiences who have been very brave in, in uh, saying, OK, bring it on. Let's see what you've got for us now. <laughs> and I think that that's. You know, exciting. I mean, it's, who wants to see the same old stuff over and over and over again? Exactly. I mean, so. and it's certainly not the same old stuff. Even no. the way you do Shakespeare is so yes. mind expanding. Yes. Every time I walk into a Shakespeare you. production of yours, Thanks. it's like a new dream or a new. Yeah. We have a great group of directors, and it's. Um, I think that there's a there's there's almost a kind of determination to be uh, a company that serves up an eclectic feast each season, uh, you know, I think that there's um, been a determination not to be labeled stylistically. I mean, no one would ever say that this company was traditional in any way, That's but you sure. also wouldn't say that we um, lean towards the avant-garde. I mean, I think that we look at each particular play individually, and then each director brings their vision to it. So the audience is getting a kind of wonderful, um, ever-changing uh, banquet, and their palates don't get bored. Yeah. <laughs> So when people get <clears throat> thirsty or hungry for more of the banquet here at Shakespeare Theatre of New Jersey, uh, of course, they can get tickets online, they can get tickets over the phone, they can purchase yeah. tickets at your box office, which is open daily, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, yep. well, we'll have all that stuff uh, labeled on all the right. screen and Great. everything. But thank you so much for You're taking your time and talking about it. It's such an impressive place, Bonnie. Thanks, Chase. And when I think about you know, this place used to be a factory making, whatever you said, valves, valves or yeah. something. <laughs> and now you're a f kind of a factory making theater. Great. Well, and we're going to be doing, um, this is going to become, in, in a weird way, an interactive museum eventually. So people will be able to come here and actually see what we do. And that'll be really exciting. So if you'd like to come to the theater, there's the phone number on your screen, or use the website and buy a ticket.